here this morning to share the story of how science, especially astronomy and physics, uh, brought me into the Christian fold. And uh, you heard that I got my PhD from the University of Toronto. I was born, raised, and educated in Canada. Uh, I grew up in British Columbia, an incredibly beautiful place where there's just mountain range after mountain range. In fact, when I was a teenager, we could climb a different mountain every weekend. Now, it's easy to find mountains in British Columbia. It was very difficult for me to meet Christians. In fact, I didn't meet any. I didn't meet Christians until I was 27 years of age. Uh, however, I got into astronomy at a rather young age. I was seven years old, and uh, it was one of those rare nights in Vancouver where it wasn't raining, and the clouds broke, and you could see stars, and I asked my parents, those stars, are they hot? They said, yes, son, they're hot. I said, please tell me why they're hot. And they said, son, here's some bus fare. You can go to the library. It was three transfers to get to the Vancouver Public Library. And, uh, you know, they wouldn't do that today, but here it was seven years of age. I just got on the bus by myself and went to the library there and came back home with five books on astronomy and physics. And that's, that's all they would let you take out. So every weekend I would do that. And literally, from the age of eight onwards, I knew that astrophysics would be my future career. And uh, I was passionate about it. And uh, literally, every year, I would look at a different sub-discipline of astronomy. Uh, one year, I looked at galaxies, like these galaxies you see here. Others, I looked at the gaseous nebulae and the stars. And with each year, I would look at a separate sub-discipline, sometimes stellar atmospheres, sometimes the interiors of stars, sometimes the spiral arm structure. When I was 16, I dedicated a year to studying cosmology. Now, cosmology is the science of the origin, structure, and history of the universe. And this is back in the 60s. And at that time, there was a big debate. Do we live in a universe that's oscillating, like the Hindus teach? Is it a steady-state universe, like you see in a lot of Buddhist faiths? Uh, is it a hesitating universe? Or is it a Big Bang universe? And even back then, the astronomical evidence was heavily favoring the Big Bang theory. Now, by the way, people always ask me, that TV show, The Big Bang Theory, is it really like that at Caltech? I was at Caltech for five years in the faculty, and I'll tell you this, they have to tone it down for the TV show. <laughs> They're actually way nerdier than what you see there. <laughs> <clears throat> And I was one of those nerds. In fact, my wife will tell you, I was definitely one of those nerds. Um, but uh, it was clear even back then that the Big Bang Theory was winning. And if it's Big Bang, there's a beginning to the universe. And if there's a beginning, there must be a beginner. So from the age of 16 onwards, I did not doubt the existence of God. But I was very skeptical that this God that created 50 billion trillion stars would want to communicate in any serious way with these beings on a little small speck we call planet Earth. However, I did begin to look at the great philosophers to see if maybe this God that created the universe indeed was communicating with us. I began by reading Immanuel Kant, because he's the father of modern-day cosmology. He writes a lot about God and the universe. But I discovered in his writings that he believed that space and time were eternal and already there was evidence that that wasn't the case. I read Descartes, read a number of other philosophers. Then I said, you know, to complete this task, I need to look at the world's great religions. And so I began with Hinduism, and they have these books that they call the Vedas, and there's actually quite a bit in there about astronomy. Uh, but what it teaches is that the universe has multiple beginnings, where there's a beginning, and then the universe collapses, and it restarts again. But what you see in the Hindu Vedas, it explicitly states that there's 4.32 billion years between one beginning of the universe and the next beginning. And I knew at age 17 that number was not correct. I also knew that the universe had an entropy measure that was 100 million times too high to permit any possible rebound of the universe. And so I put Hinduism aside. Now, the public high school I attended in Vancouver was 80% Asian. I mean, they now call Vancouver Hongcouver because of all the influx of the Asians uh, that have come in. 
And the dominant religion besides atheism in our public school was, was Buddhism. So I looked at the Buddhist commentaries and found out that when it came to the universe, they borrowed their material unchanged from Hinduism. So I put aside Buddhism. And then I looked at the Quran. And the Quran has three different texts that deal with creation, but they actually contradict one another. And one of them says that the stars are closer to us than the planets. And even with a naked eye, you can tell that the planets must be much closer to us than the stars. The Greeks figured that out. They determined the stars had to be bodies just like the sun because of the fact that they couldn't measure parallax with a naked eye. Uh, but I think I found a number of other issues. For example, in the Quran, it tells us that the gestation period for the human female is six months. And that said, well, it must have been written by a man. Most women would know it's nine months. So, <clears throat> But finally, uh, I did pick up a Bible. Now, and I told you earlier that I didn't meet Christians till I was 27 years of age. That's happened when I joined the Caltech faculty. In fact, I can tell you this, when I arrived at Caltech, I was stunned by how many of the most famous astronomers that were there, Nobel laureates included, were actually followers of Jesus Christ. And uh, they showed me how to find a church. That church put me on their pastoral staff seven months later. I'm still on the pastoral staff of that church. And by the way, that church, which is sandwiched between Caltech and JPL, Fuller Seminary, and the headquarters of the Skeptic Society, we have an interesting congregation, as you can imagine. <laughs> Uh, they were the ones that helped me launch Reasons to Believe some 28 years ago. So I credit them uh, for that. But uh, when I was 11 years of age, two businessmen came into our public school. They never got closer than 30 feet from my desk, but they put on our teacher's desk two boxes, and in those boxes were Gideon Bibles. They didn't say a word but we were all invited to come forward and take one of those Gideon Bibles. And I still carry that Gideon Bible around with me that I got when I was 11 years of age. Now the cover is gone. That's because our dog a few years ago chewed the cover off the Gideon Bible. And I have two sons. One of them said, our dog is from the pit of hell because he's destroying the Word of God. But my other son put it in a more positive light. No, we have a dog that's feeding on the Word of God. So. <laughs> So that's why the cover is gone. Uh, but I'm kind of glad I waited until I was 17 to pick up that book. It literally stayed on my shelf, untouched, unread, for six years. And when I opened it, I realized that the Gideons had given me a foreign language edition we call the King James Translation. <laughs> and if I had read it at age 11, I think I would have been quite intimidated. But by the time I was 17, thanks to my public school education, I had already been exposed to 13 of William Shakespeare's plays. In fact, I had memorized literally over 2,000 lines. Don't ask me to repeat it now, but back then I could, uh, from Bill Shakespeare. So I was fluent in King James English when I picked up this book. And right away I noticed how different it was. It wasn't vague, it wasn't esoteric, it wasn't repetitious like you see in the other holy books. It was clear and direct and specific, giving you names, dates, talking about uh, geography, history, and science. And I said, this is a book that I can put to the test without a whole lot of trouble. And what particularly impressed me about this book is it commanded objective testing. Now, you know, when I looked at the Mormon scriptures, what you see there is you know this is true if you have a warm feeling in the bosom. I call that subjective evidence. And maybe that explains why Mormons don't drink coffee. But... Uh, <laughs> What I found in this book, four different places. In fact, I actually saw it in your service out of Malachi, but here's one from Thessalonians. Test everything, hold on to the good. You know, a lot of skeptics think that we Christians have blind faith. There's no support for that in the Bible. Four different words are translated as faith. Every one of them means acting upon established truth. And before you believe, put it to the test. But if it proves to be correct and good, then you want to act upon what you know to be true. I say that because I have a lot of scientists, friends who believe in God, but they don't act upon what they know to be true. And so test everything, hold fast to that which is good. But what really impressed me as a 17-year-old, the Bible not only 
gave me the exhortation to put everything to the test. It showed me step by step how to put everything to the test. Now, I don't know what it's like here in Texas, but when I was educated, I was taught the scientific method in grade one. We got it in grade two. We got it all 12 years. But none of my public school teachers told me where the scientific method came from. When I picked up this book, I found it on the very first page. In fact, I find it in every single major creation text in the Bible, which is why I prefer to refer to the biblical or the scientific method as the biblical testing method. And it's no accident that the scientific revolution exploded out of Reformation Europe. The Reformation is when ordinary people were allowed to read the Bible for themselves, and those with a scientific bent discovered this testing method, applied it to their scientific endeavors, and that was the birth of the scientific revolution. And what I'm going to show you in the next few minutes is how the application of the biblical testing method transforms Genesis 1 from being the biggest scientific embarrassment for the Christian community to being our most potent evidence that the Bible is the inspired and errant Word of God. Now, the first step of that biblical testing method is don't interpret until you establish the frame of reference. And it was Galileo who said at his court trial, the biggest mistake you can make in Bible interpretation is to get the wrong point of view. Well, let's actually see what the text says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I was curious at age 17, what is this heavens and the earth? And I went through the whole Old Testament and discovered not once do you see the word universe. In biblical Hebrew, there is no word for universe. There is in Greek, but not in biblical Hebrew. Instead, they have this phrase, the Shemayan Ares, the heavens and the earth, used nine times in the Old Testament, always in reference to the entirety of physical reality, all matter, all energy, all space and time. And it uses the word create, which means to bring into existence something brand new that never existed before. So right there in Genesis 1-1 is making the declaration that there's a God beyond space, time, matter, and energy who creates this entire universe. When you go to the New Testament, Hebrews 11, the universe that we can detect did not come from that which we can detect. And there's also specific passages in the Bible that tell us that God was active before the beginning of time. 2 Timothy 1.9, the grace of God that we now experience was put into effect before the beginning of time. Now, I'd already been through the other holy books. What you see in those holy books is a declaration that God or gods or cosmic forces create within space and time that eternally exists. The Bible is, stands alone in saying, no, God created outside, independent of space and time. Space and time don't exist until God creates this universe. Now, I was reading this Gideon Bible during the same era when physicists in Britain were developing the first of the space-time theorems. The power of these theorems is they're based on only two assumptions. Condition one, the theorem is true if the universe contains mass, and look around you, you're all evidence that indeed the universe contains mass, some of you a little more so than others, so you can take credit for that. Condition number two, that general relativity reliably describes the movements of bodies in the universe. Now, when I was a teenager, we only knew that general relativity was reliable to two places of the decimal. Thanks to new testing, general relativity today ranks as the most exhaustively tested and best proven principle in all of physics. We now know it reliably describes movements of bodies in the universe to 15 places of the decimal, which means there's no longer any basis for doubting the conclusion of his theorem. And what is the conclusion? Space and time have a beginning. Space and time are created, implying that there must be a causal agent beyond space and time that creates our universe of matter, energy, space, and time. If you came here this morning wanting rigorous scientific proof that the God of the Bible exists, you have it right here in these space-time theorems. And this is now being conceded by our nation's leading atheist physicists and astronomers. 
You know, when I debate these physicists and astronomers, they recognize that because of these space-time theorems, they have to concede at a minimum a deistic worldview. You actually see this in Lawrence Krauss's latest book, A Universe from Nothing, where he says on page 173, one cannot rule out such a deistic view of nature. And it's because of the force of these space-time theorems. So the battle is shifted from whether or not there is a God to whether or not this God that created the universe and sets up the math and the physics is a personal being. So we've already gotten past that step. Now the debate is, is this God a personal being? And this is where the six days of creation come in because there we have the biblical declaration and the scientific support that indeed God is not just a transcendent entity but also a personal being. And what I discovered as I was going through the Old Testament is that it makes numerous statements about the universe. The Bible has ten times the content on the origin and structure of the universe than all the rest of the world's holy books combined. And there's four things about the universe that the Bible repeatedly addresses, in each case in multiple passages. One is that the universe can be traced back to a singularity beginning. Now, you won't find the word singularity in the Bible, but what you will see are repeated statements that the whole universe can be traced back to a space-time beginning. But it has even more to say about the expansion of the universe. Now, you won't see this in Genesis, but you will in Job and Psalms. You'll see it in uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Zechariah. Repeated declarations that God stretches out the heavens. But the verb that's translated stretching out, the verb nata, means the expansion of whatever is being described. And what impressed me as a 17-year-old, I knew because of my studies in astronomy that there is no book of science or history or philosophy that even hinted that we live in a continuously expanding universe except for the Bible. For thousands of years, it was the only book that made that declaration. It's also the only book that made the declaration that the laws of physics don't change. Seven places in the Bible it declares that we live in a universe where the physics is established at the space-time beginning and that physics remains until evil is conquered and removed. Jeremiah 33, 25, where God declares, you change, but I don't change. As proof that I don't change, look at the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they don't change, I don't change. Chapter 33 of Jeremiah. <clears throat> then fourthly, it says that we live in a universe that's dominated by a pervasive law of decay. You see that in Romans. The entire creation is subject to a law of decay. Or look at Ecclesiastes, where Solomon tells us everything is decaying with respect to time. Hey, look around you in this auditorium. All of you are evidence of progressive decay. I mean, even little children. If you look carefully at their face, you can see little tiny liver spots that are about to expand as they get older and older. We're all subject to this pervasive law of decay, and everything in the universe is. Well, I recognize that if the universe has a space-time beginning, and it's expanding from that space-time beginning under laws that don't change, or one of those laws is a pervasive law of decay, it's a universe that's getting colder and colder. That principle applies to everything. Anything that expands get colder uh, as it continues to expand. Your automobile engine, when the piston chamber expands, the temperature goes down. When the piston chamber compresses, the temperature goes up. With a space-time beginning, we know the universe started off infinitesimally small, which means because of its energy content, it had to be near infinitely hot. But as it expanded, it got colder and colder. Now, if we know the age of the universe, and today we've got a measurement that's accurate to four places of the decimal on the age of the universe, 13.79 billion plus or minus uh, 0 0.04 uh, billion. Knowing that, and knowing that the Bible says about the universe, we can come up with a biblically predicted cooling curve for the universe. And this is what it looks like. Okay. That solid curve, and notice those orange-red spots you see there. 
Those are actual measurements that we astronomers have made of the past temperature of the universe. And notice that our measurements perfectly fit that curve that you see there. So this is dramatic evidence that thousands of years ago, the Bible not only told us what the conditions of the universe are like, it actually gives us things that we can put to scientific tests by direct uh, measurements. Now, that's Genesis 1.1. Where skeptics have gone wrong in saying the Bible teaches scientific nonsense in terms of creation is they fail to recognize that the point of view changes from verse 1 to verse 2. For verse 1, the frame of reference is the universe as a whole. But in Genesis 1-2, the text says, the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters of planet Earth. It's not God telling us the story the six days from the perspective of a being outside of Earth looking down on the Earth. Rather, it's telling us what was happening from the point of view of the surface of the Earth. Below the clouds, not above the clouds. Step two of the biblical testing method. Don't interpret and you also establish the starting conditions. Well, when you read the rest of Genesis 1-2, it says the Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the waters, and it's dark on the surface of the waters. The water covers the entire surface of the earth, and the earth is formless and void. It's empty of life, and it's unfit for life, and now the Spirit of God begins to work. Now, creation day one, let there be light. It doesn't say that God created the light. He did that when he created the universe in Genesis 1.1. There is light in the universe, but it's dark on the surface of the waters because the primordial earth would not let light penetrate through the cloud layer. Let there be light. God transforms the atmosphere from opaque to translucent. Now, this is implied in Genesis 1, but there are three other texts in the Bible that also take you through the six creation days, Job 37, 38, and 39, Psalm 104, and Proverbs 8. And when you go to the book of Job, in the context of what was going on before day one, God speaks and says, I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness. So notice here it's explicit as to why it's dark on the surface of the waters. God had blanketed the primordial earth with clouds that would not let light pass through. And so day one, light can now pass through, photosynthesis can begin, uh, light is or life is created at that time. Creation day two, let there be water above and water below. That's all it says. That's all it needs to be said because Job had already covered it. By the way, there's good textual evidence that the book of Job predates the content of Genesis by five or six hundred years. I say that because a lot of skeptics ridicule Genesis for what it leaves out. Moses didn't have to repeat what Job had already put out there in that text. And the book of Job, you've got a chapter and a half that expands on day two, Job 37 and the first half of Job 38, and talks about how God not only set up water above and water below, but describes many kinds of precipitation, uh, namely that there was rain, there was mist, there was dew, there was frost, there was hail, there was snow. And what you notice in Job, it makes a declaration that we need all these different forms of precipitation if we're going to sustain global civilization. And so God blessed us this planet with not just a simple water cycle, but a very complex, stable, and abundant water cycle. Now, this DVD journey toward creation, we still have some left out there at the table. It's a television documentary. It's been shown in six different countries, including Russia and China and Mongolia. It's in 11 languages. Um, we actually have a video clip that describes how scientists discovered the miracle of what happened in Creation Day 1 and Creation Day 2. And if you read a, a recent issue of Nature, they actually have a whole section of the British journal Nature dedicated to what happened on day one, day two. It's called the moon-forming event. And what they discovered is the moon has remarkable evidence for design for the benefit of human beings. So much so that these moon experts said, we have to redo our models. There's too much design here. So this whole issue of nature, well, 
good chunk of this issue of nature is devoted to what has been done to redo the models. They redid the models and they came up with even more design, an order of magnitude more design when they had in the former models. And I love what one of the researchers said, this is causing philosophical disquiet amongst our myths. But hey, Genesis said it first. Creation day three, let there be the land masses. This is when God transformed the planet from a water world to where we have oceans and continents coexisting. And thanks to plate tectonics, we now can actually calculate the growth of the continents with respect to time, verifying that indeed Earth started off as a water world and then small volcanic islands began to pop up. And then because of the design of the Earth's oceans, about four kilometers deep, you got what's called class six liquid water at the bottom of the ocean. That sets up a chemical reaction that causes the basalts to be transformed into silicates, which are lighter than the basalts, so they float up and eventually you get continents. Well, notice what you see here in this graph, that the time of the most aggressive growth of continents is when the Earth is about two billion years old a little bit less than half of its current age. Where does Genesis put it? Six days of creation. It puts it on the first part of creation day three. And so you get a fit if you overlay the age of the universe with these six days of creation. Now that you've got continents, what does the text say? Second half of creation day three, let the plants proliferate on the continental land masses. And so this is when our continents have the uh, plants now, years ago, I debated Michael Shermer of the Skeptic Society. He's the executive director. And he, every time I've debated him, I've debated him four times, he always ridicules Genesis 1. In fact, this happened. We were at the University of Texas. We were laying out the scientific evidence for God, and Michael Shermer was supposed to rebut what we had to say. He ignored all that and went after Genesis 1. But what he was saying is, Genesis clearly gets it wrong because it puts the plants on the land masses before the animals in the oceans. And the fossil record says it's the other way around. Our response was to say, well, wait a minute. Animals have bones and shells. Their fossils are going to be much more easily preserved than the plant fossils. But the good news is we've now actually found the isotope signature as well as fossils that demonstrate that plants were just as abundant in the continental land masses for 600 million years before the Cambrian explosion, the first appearance of animals in the oceans, as the 600 million years thereafter. So thanks to this evidence, we now have vindication of the order of events in Genesis 1. Creation day four, let there be the great lights. And this is when, for the first time, creatures on the surface of the earth can actually see the sun, moon, and stars in the sky. God created them before the six days. Their light comes through the atmosphere in day one, but not until day four does the atmosphere get transformed from being permanently overcast to where it's at least transparent enough where creatures can now see the sun, moon, and stars. Verse 14, let there be the great lights, Verse 15, so that they may serve as signs to mark seasons, days, and years. Obvious question, for whose benefit? Well, what I notice as a teenager, all the life mentioned before day four doesn't need to know where the sun, moon, and stars are in the sky. But all the life after day four does. The animals, in order to migrate at the right time of the year, hibernate at the right time of the year, reproduce at the right time of the year, at least on occasion, they need to know where the sun, moon, and stars are in the sky. And now, scientifically, we understand what it was that brought about this transformation. It's called the second great oxygenation event, a time just before the Cameron explosion, when the atmosphere went from 1% oxygen up to 8%, then to 10%. And that 8 to 10 percent is the minimum level required to sustain animal life. And the Cameron explosion is an event that happened 543 million years ago, where suddenly all these animal life forms come into existence. Now, of all the mathematically possible animal body plans, 86 percent show up at the Cameron explosion. And they're right there at the beginning, including vertebrates, show up right at the beginning of the Cameron explosion what optimize ecological relationships. One of the biggest challenges to the Darwinian paradigm 
Even Richard Dawkins himself has declared, these animals come out of nowhere with no evolutionary history. Well, God's the one that stepped in and created these. And he created them all at once. One reason why he creates all of these different body plans for animals all at once, that's the only way that you can have enough time to build up the all the bio deposits of coal, oil, natural gas, all the concentrated metals we need so we can launch and sustain civilization. I don't know about you, but when our family celebrates Thanksgiving, we thank God for those Cameron Explosion animals for all the resources that enables us to enjoy our Thanksgiving at dinner. And this is Creation Day 5. Let the seas swarm with abundant sea animals. That's the Cameron Explosion. But God is not done. On Creation Day 5, he creates birds and he creates sea mammals. Uses the word create for only the second time. Because now we're talking about life that's not just physical, it's life that's physical and soulish. These birds and mammals are endowed with mind, will, and emotions so that they can form relationships with us human beings and serve and please us human beings. God designed them to serve a higher species, and he's designed all of you to serve a higher being. We are body, soul, and spirit. Now, creation day six, jumps ahead. By the way, Genesis 1 never addresses when God creates the first land mammals. Instead, it jumps ahead to describe three highly specialized kinds of land mammals that God created so we human beings could launch and sustain civilization. That's the theme of the book of Job, that we humans would have been stuck in the Stone Age if it wasn't for God creating these specialized land mammals. Category 1, the short-legged land mammals, a reference to the rodents. You say, what do we need those for? Well, they're warm-blooded, they're small, and the only way they can keep their bodies warm in a cool climate is to grow thick, luxuriant fur. And we have archaeological evidence that early humans exploited these mammals to develop the clothing that they needed to be able to move into all the climate zones of the world. But they're also serving us today because God designed these rodents with DNA so that we can actually use mice and rats, for example, to develop medical advances to deal with human infirmities. And then he created two different kinds of long-legged land animals, uh, the uh, ones that are easy to tame, a reference to herbivores like goats and sheep and cows, which he God designed to launch agricultural industry, and then long-legged land mammals that are difficult to tame. Difficult to tame, but once tamed, make excellent companions. These are the household pets that we have. And they also make great uh, animals for herding our herbivorous animals and also make good guard animals. I mean, what better guard animal could you have than that, right? Uh, and this is all described in some detail in my book, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job. I wrote that book because I realized no Christian had ever addressed in book form the second origin of life the origin of life that's physical and soulish. And I especially love the way Job says, look to the birds, they'll instruct you. Look to the beasts of the field, and they will teach you. They'll teach you things about yourself, about God, and the way you can develop a relationship with God. That's hidden treasures in the book of Job. And last of all, God creates human beings. And here again, it uses the word create, because what's brand new about us human beings we're the only species of life that is endowed with a spirit. And it's because of the spirit within us, we can ask questions like, why am I here? Why is the universe here? Is there a God? And can I form a relationship with that God? Again, as God designed the birds and mammals to serve and please us, he designed us to serve and please uh, God himself. Well, when I was 10 years of age, I read a book that described the great creation myths of the different cultures of the world. Every culture's got one, over a hundred different creation stories. The best I found outside of the Bible was the Enuma Elisha of the Babylonians, describing 14 events of creation, getting two right and 12 wrong. How did the others score? They all got zero, but the Enuma Elisha got two out of 14 right. I got a theory for that. However, what we see in Genesis 1, once we recognize that the Hebrew word yom that's translated day, it's got four different literal definitions, and one of those literal definitions is an epoch of time. 
and at the frame of reference is the surface of the earth for the six days, this is the score you get. Four for four on the initial conditions and ten for ten on the events of creation. It gets a perfect score. Moses not only described these ten events of creation in a scientifically correct manner, he had them all in the correct chronological sequence. And I realized that would be impossible unless this Moses was inspired by the one that actually created everything. Now, that was the beginning of an 18-month test of the Bible. I studied the Bible for one or two hours a day uh, for an 18-month period. That's how long it took me to get a Revelation 22. At the end of those 18 months, I recognized I had not found a single provable error in the text or contradiction. And I'd found in that period of time over 200 places in the Bible where it accurately predicted scientific discoveries. And at age 19, I calculated the probability that all these Bible authors could have come up with these statements without being inspired by God. That probability is less than one chance in 10 to the 300th power. It happened to be the same week that my thermodynamics professor at the University of British Columbia gave us a problem assignment to calculate the probability that one of us physics students would be killed by a sudden reversal of the second law of thermodynamics. Now, if I had a few minutes, I could show you how you could calculate that for yourself. But let me just get to the bottom line. There's only one chance in 10 to the 80th of that happening. It's such a tiny possibility that we can confidently state it's never happened anytime, anywhere in the universe. But notice what I had just done. I had demonstrated to myself that this book is at least 10 to the 220 times more reliable than the second law of thermodynamics, and therefore it would be irrational for me not to put even greater confidence and trust in the message of this book. And that's what motivated me one August night, in fact, it was on August 6, 107 in the morning, I signed my name in the back of this Gideon Bible, giving my life to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, if you would like a DVD where I kind of go into this in more detail, you can get it at that URL. We also have a book at the table there, just published, Navigating Genesis, where I take you through the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And why do we focus on those 11 chapters? That's where over 90% of the objections come from skeptics and atheists for accepting the Bible as the error-free Word of God. So we take you through all those passages. Then this book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is, where we look at the problem of evil. And here's the amazing thing. God actually designed all the laws of physics to target the problem of evil. And that's why those laws of physics will not exist in new creation, because evil won't be there. But in closing, let me share this with you. If God cared and supernaturally intervened so much in preparing the universe, the earth, and all of its life for the entry of human beings, how much more must he care and want to supernaturally intervene and the life of every one of you. You know, it tells us in Psalm 147 that God knows the name of every star. There's 50 billion trillion stars in the observable universe alone. By the way, do not spend $54 to have your wife or girlfriend named after a star. I can tell you, you can name seven trillion stars after every human being and not run out. And here's a trivia question. Of all those names that you pay $54 for, how many are recognized by the International Astronomical Union? That many. <laughs> Save the $54. <laughs> okay. But here's the whole point. Those stars are nothing but giant balls of gas. You are way more than a giant ball of gas. God is going to care for you to a much greater degree. And he wants a relationship with every one of you. So I encourage you, check out the evidence, and when you find, prove to yourself it's true, it's really, that's the point where you can let God take control. And what I learned from the Gideons is this, God knows better than we do what's best for our life. It only makes sense to put him in charge of our life and take direction from him. He knows what's best. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ross.
Let's show our appreciation to Dr. Heroff's